He was a bluebird. Where he had come from, why he was what he was, and how, these never crossed his mind. He hadn't a care in the world. He could fly. He was a bluebird. And it was wonderful. On a green meadow, he fluttered and flew, first up and down, then in little circles, ever widening, ever higher, with a clean sense of exhilaration. Up, up, until he saw another bird approaching him rather merrily, a girl bird, a female bluebird. How she talked to him, he didn't know and didn't care. They flew around one another in a joyous dance of fellowship as she invited him, seemingly from her mind to his, in a language beyond words, to join her. There's a place I want to show you, she seemed to say, up, up there, past the cloud, or inside the cloud, but I can't tell you, I have to show you, follow me. And he followed her, up, up through the clear blue, in the light-hearted sunshine, up, up, jollily up into the cloud. As they entered the cloud, he could sense her nearness to him and hear the gay flap of her wings, though he couldn't see her. Indeed, he couldn't even tell how he knew up from down in the cloud, but he knew. And they continued ascending, blissfully ascending, in circles round and around one another, up through the cloud, together. When they emerged, it was far brighter than it had been under the cloud, but his eyes adjusted quickly to see, of all things, a roller skating rink with a big ball with mirrors. He didn't know it was called a disco ball, suspended from he knew not what on the cloud, and many little birds of sundry shapes and colors roller skating happily to a musical track. Now we must forgive his credulity and indulge his suspension of disbelief, for he was very young and he was exultant. How they donned their skates, he never knew and he never cared, but there they were, he and she, two bluebirds roller skating in a roller rink in the clouds. He wanted it to never end. But then he noticed it was cold. Had it been a snow cloud after all, or had something changed? Oh, it was quite cold, and where was she? The dreamer was awakened by another voice, a real voice. Time for school, sounded his dad's kindly but assertive baritone. His dad had carried him from his room and thrown him into a snowdrift to wake him up. Now you must not think his father was cruel for doing this. The boy, for our dreamer was a little boy, was an unusually heavy sleeper. Some mornings he would roll out of bed and under the bed without waking up, and sometimes no amount of words or jostling would arouse him. The snow was light and powdery and deep. His father lifted him up and carried him inside the brown brick house. There was breakfast. There his mother had packed his metal lunchbox. She pecked his forehead, and he was off to kindergarten. They lived in a valley and carpooled with other children to a school in the mountains, a school where they learned to count in French and read Le Petit Prince. He rather liked the school, though he was often sent home with notes pinned to his lapel reading things like, He makes strange noises in class, or He chased Melissa across the playground. She fell and skinned her knee. Why he should not have chased Melissa was a complete mystery to him. All the children at play had shouted, Girls chase boys, and he had then run from the girls. Then someone shouted, Boys chase girls, and he had picked Melissa. He hadn't wanted her to fall at all, much less skin her knee. Sometimes, though, he was indeed outright disobedient, for Thad was a stubborn boy. Father McKinley had a paddle in his office for such occasions, though the tears that fell from Thad's eyes after such chastisements were less from the sting of the paddle and due more to his admiration for Father McKinley himself. A widower priest with grown children and grandchildren, Father McKinley was unusually tall, so tall that he had to stoop under the doorway to enter their classroom. Thad's own father was over six feet, but Father McKinley dwarfed him. This morning he was carpooling with Don, whose mother would drive them out of the valley and into the mountains, up through a series of tunnels to St. Agnes' school.
He had overheard an adult complaining about carpal tunnel syndrome and had erroneously concluded that it was nausea resulting from winding roads through tunnels and mountains, or carpool tunnel syndrome. He was only five. Don had buck teeth and sucked his thumb. Every time they rode together, they determined to play He-Man, but instead they spent the whole trip quarreling over who was going to be He-Man and who was going to be Skeletor. Don thought he should be He-Man, because he and only he had a He-Man lunchbox. If they had ever agreed, I'm not sure either of them even knew how to play He-Man. But they never agreed. When they got out of the car, he saw a curious thing. In the gravel, which was part of the landscaping around St. Agnes School, there were dozens and dozens of snails. They were congregated together in little bundles of slime, blowing slime bubbles, or so it seemed to him. Bubbles upon slime bubbles, upon snails, upon bubbles. The wondrous scene absolutely mesmerized him, and he lost all sense of time. Don's mother awakened him from his trance, pinching the muscle of his upper arm and exclaiming, Thad, I thought you had gone to class. Now come on. She dragged him past a large mural depicting a beautiful little girl with black hair, radiating innocence, and holding in her arms a little lamb.